esta tarde en nombre del Museo Arqueológico Nacional y agradecerle su numerosa presencia para compartir la, la conferencia del profesor Jamilakis, a quien tenemos el gusto de presentar y que seguro que no va a dejar indiferente a nadie, ya que nos abre una atractiva y novedosa vía de acercarnos al pasado de, las manos, de la mano, de las sensaciones y de los sentidos. Eh, Jamilakis es profesor de Arqueología en la Universidad de Southampton, en el Reino Unido. Estudió en las universidades de Creta y Sheffield. Ha impartido clases en numerosas universidades como Wells Lampeter, en Barcelona, Columbia, Dijamon, eh, Dublín, en el que ha impartido también conferencias, Providence, Nottingham, Heidelberg, San Felipe en Chile, en fin, es infinito su, su recorrido. Y eh, en este momento se encuentra en España, eh, ayer estuvo en Santiago de Compostela, hoy nos hace el honor de estar aquí entre nosotros y mañana estará en, en Barcelona. Es miembro fundador también y coordinador del Foro de Arqueología Radical y ha codirigido y dirigido numerosas excavaciones arqueológicas y proyectos de etnografía arqueológica, como el de Caluria en la Argólida, en el Peloponeso, o el yacimiento de Cutrulo Magula en Tesalia. Eh, sus inquietudes científicas son eh, numerosísimas ¿no? y le han conducido a interesarse por la investigación sobre la sociopolítica del pasado, la relación entre los nacionalismos y la arqueología, pero también sobre la propia teoría arqueológica, la arqueología del Egeo y, de manera especial, sobre la arqueología del cuerpo, de la comida, la bebida y eh, los sentidos, como veremos hoy. Eh, además de numerosos artículos, es autor o coautor de una docena de libros, entre ellas The Nation and its Ruins, La Nación y sus Ruinas, en el 2007, eh, donde reflexiona sobre las lecturas de la arqueología en la construcción de la Grecia moderna, ¿no? Y, eh, sobre todo, eh, la arqueología y los sentidos, eh, experiencia, memoria y afecto, que fue publicada ya en el 2013 y cuya reciente traducción eh, al castellano y su publicación por la editorial Haas Arqueología, eh, de la que luego el, el editor nos dirá unas palabras, nos reúne hoy aquí. Eh, Jamilakis nos invita en su libro a una nueva forma de adentrarnos en el pasado de la mano de los sentidos y frente a la arqueología tradicional, que nos devolvía una materialidad estática en ocasiones, aboga, como veremos, por una mirada nueva e integradora donde la multisensorialidad y los afectos cobran un papel relevante, reivindicando justamente los afectos y los sentidos y las sensaciones como parte fundamental de la construcción y deconstrucción de las sociedades Jamilakis pone ahora el foco de atención sobre la importancia de todos estos poderosos agentes, tanto en la construcción, en el tejer y en el destejer de la memoria y del olvido. ¿No? Y eh, antes de ceder la palabra a Jaime Almansa, al editor, y puesto que estamos en un museo, me vais a permitir que haga un poco de, de publicidad. Y eh, deciros que esta vía novedosa también de acercamiento al, al pasado eh, se está viendo camino en las propias instituciones e invitaros desde aquí a que visitéis la exposición eh, de, eh, sobre tiempo de melancolía en el Museo Nacional de Escultura de Valladolid, que ahora va a transitar por Valencia y posteriormente por Barcelona, y donde es justamente de la mano de la melancolía como uno se adentra en el arte de los siglos XVI y XVII. ¿eh? Por lo tanto, también tiene una, una vertiente práctica. Y, eh, sin más demora, cedo la palabra a Jaime Almansa, que nos va a contar el, el proceso de, de edición. Bueno, pues muy buenas tardes a todos. Lo primero de todo, no puedo comenzar a hablar sin agradecer de verdad y, y de corazón al museo en general y a Andrés eh, Tejetero, el director en particular, la oportunidad de poder estar hoy aquí porque, de hecho, pues la organización de esta mini gira ¿no? que hemos intentado preparar para poder tener a Yanis aquí en España compartiendo sus últimos trabajos no habría sido posible seguramente en un ambiente como el que tenemos si, sin su colaboración. Obviamente, pues bueno, agradeceros a vosotros vuestra presencia, a Yanis desde luego, a, bueno, a Margarita por presentarnos. Y yo voy a ser muy breve y simplemente quería apuntar eh, esta parte un poco más personal ¿no? de cómo llegamos hasta aquí eh, a través de un libro, pero a través de un libro que habla de sentidos y de experiencias y de afecto, que es un poco cómo se fue forjando esta historia. Eh, creo que todos los que estamos aquí hemos conocido a Yanis Jamilakis a través de una de sus dos principales vertientes, bien la arqueología del Egeo, bien su arqueología más radical, eh, entendiendo un poco pues, estas relaciones entre política y arqueología y su crítica al capitalismo. Yo le conocí por esa segunda vertiente y bueno, había leído muchísimos trabajos. Tuve la suerte de coincidir con él hace dos años y medio en, 
un congreso organizado en Porto Alegre, en Brasil, y poco a poco, con la convivencia de esos días, empezamos a hablar pues, un poco de estos proyectos comunes que nos llevan a ver eh, el futuro de la arqueología de, de una forma bastante similar, ¿no? empezando por esta vertiente más política y terminando por esta nueva vertiente que en ese momento todavía no había aparecido tampoco en su edición original, pero que ya nos estaba contando y que desde luego llevaba bastante tiempo practicando. Eh, en aquel congreso, ¿no? como fruto de esa experiencia, de esa convivencia y del afecto que se creó entre un poco ambos y todos los que estábamos allí, surgió la idea de poder traer al castellano este nuevo libro que estaba a punto de publicar en Inglaterra y que yo consideraba que podría ser un tema bastante interesante para tener en cuenta aquí en España. ¿Por qué? Porque cuando comienzo con, con la editorial, eh, comienzo con ella como un proyecto personal de traer a España o de publicar en España determinados trabajos que normalmente no eran muy recogidos ¿no? dentro de la bibliografía de nuestro país. Eh, la primera apuesta por, por la traducción fue este libro, ¿no? Y yo supongo pues, que ha sido acertada, entre otras cosas, porque no solo plantea uno de los movimientos teóricos más innovadores de los últimos años en el mundo de la arqueología, sino que además nos permite acercarnos a ella de una forma completamente diferente, ¿no? mucho más experiencial de lo que estamos acostumbrados. Entonces, bueno, no me quiero extender más, simplemente agradecer de nuevo a Yanis la confianza, ¿no? porque si él en ese momento pues, no me hubiera dejado comprar los derechos, nunca me habría aventurado a ello. Y nada, me ahorraré la crítica a Cambridge University Press por sus políticas editoriales y demás, pero simplemente decir que si estáis interesados en acercaros a lo que hoy nos va a contar, tenéis el libro disponible aquí o seguramente en muchas otras librerías y creo que os va a abrir un horizonte nuevo ¿no? de, de experiencia hacia nuestro trabajo y hacia nuestra profesión. Así que, bueno, sin más, muchas gracias de nuevo y empecemos con lo que hemos venido a escuchar hoy. Buenas tardes, and muchas gracias to everybody, to Jaime and to Margarita for introducing me and to everybody who, for being here. I apologize that I'm going to talk in, in English. Um, I'm very glad to be here because I have uh, been interacting with a number of colleagues from uh, Madrid, from the rest of Spain for a number of years. Um, we share several of the ideas I've been developing for Uh, for this book as well as for other books, ideas about the politics of the past or um, archaeology and human experience or the links between archaeology and ethnography. And I'm very glad that I have the chance of uh, these, um, you know, um, three very hectic days to talk to a number of you and have uh, the opportunity, hopefully more after the talk, to, to interact with you and, and exchange um, views and opinions. I was asked by Jaime today and by the museum to do a paper summarizing the main points, the main ideas that I analyze in the book. I'm going to do so by using a range of different examples, some of them contemporary, very contemporary happening now, some of them uh, more conventionally archeological. So you will see in a minute that uh, the, the order and the analysis is going to be a bit idiosyncratic. I will finish by presenting um, just a glimpse of the latter part of the book when I apply some of the ideas on sensoriality on Bronze Age Crete, the area where I've done a lot of work on, uh, to show how some of these ideas can actually animate, activate um, a specific archaeological context and a specific body of material culture. It's going to be wall paintings from Knossos. But that's at the end of the talk. Before that, we have um, some time to discuss the, the main concepts of the book. So I, will, I would like to start by conjuring up two very different vignettes. The first one, imagine that you are one of the hundreds of thousands of millions of people from the global south, or even a war refugee from Syria right now, whose only hope appears to be to cross the border and find herself to the other side, the global north, which offers the often false promise 
of relative prosperity, or at least bare survival. Your faith then is to spend often many years in transit, in constant movement, paperless, undocumented, illegal, at the hands of smugglers and profiteers, but also at the mercy of people of similar faith who may facilitate your passage through endless boundaries. Thousands of you in similar position will never make it, drowned instead in the Mediterranean as they try to cross into fortress Europe, the promised land of the European Union, or summarily deported or pushed back by the at times violent border guards, the infamous Frontex, which ironically has adopted as its logo the phrase libertas, securitas, justicia. Or sniff out by vicious dogs, or detected by X-ray vision at the back of a lorry in Calais, in the French and British border, and thrown into a detention center for months or even killed in the Sonora Desert by militias just after crossing the Mexican and US border, or knifed in the streets of Athens by neo-Nazi gangs. Vast amounts of money have been spent in building fences, in reinforcing borders, in funding guards, in creating detention centers, and in funding scholars, sociologists, migration specialists, political scientists, and some anthropologists. And yet, the tragedy that is undocumented or irregular migration continues. And as far as the scholarly debate and knowledge is concerned, we are still far from understanding the experiential weight and impact of the phenomenon. The intricacies of the embodied and sensorial world that undocumented migrants inhabit. It is my conviction that, in addition to the important work being done already by sociologists, legal scholars, and others, anthropological archaeologists, and other material culture specialists can contribute immensely to, the new, to a new understanding of the phenomenon. But in order for such potential to be realized, we will need a reconfigured archaeology, a sensorial archaeology of flows, not static entities, be it things or bodies, a multisensorial archaeology of memory and affectivity. Come to think of it, undocumented migration is a material and sensorial experience first and foremost. It is the lack of specific pieces of paper that assign to these people an alien status, a status of non-existence as political beings, and attributes to them the status of bare lives, to quote Giorgio Agamben here, relegates them to a condition of what two anthropologists, Gonzalez and Chavez, have recently called objectivity objectivity, depriving them of the right to have a bios, to have a life, a, bio, a biographical life, that is the life of a recognized citizen. They are, as we know, some papier. The material apparatuses of the undocumented migrant, the things that he or she brings with them, are crucially important in the journey from the homeland to the country of destination. There are normally very few objects, the absolute essential to make the journey as light as possible, but which may lead to unintended consequences. As the important undocumented migration project by the US, uh, on the US and Mexican border, directed by Jason De Leon has showed, the clothes and the shoes that help the documented migrant to blend in with the people of the country of destination 
are often the same clothes that betray them before the virtue of the crossing because they stand out in the home country and its borderlands, rising that suspicion and leading to arrest. Mexicans trying to cross into the US wearing gringo clothes, so they're immediately you know, spotted and taken off the bus um, to be arrested. Or water bottles may need to be painted black so as not to reflect sunlight, but um, which will increase water temperature, making it undrinkable at the end. So how material culture traps them in that sense. But even from the point of view of states and states' apparatuses, it is the materialization and objectification of legality and illegality and of prevention which have become recently more prominent. Borders have acquired a more uh, conspicuous, highly visible and tactile presence more than ever before in modern times. Walls and fences are being erected um, along border lines. Patrols are in operation in the land as well as in the sea. And symbolic and material borders are even being enacted everywhere, including in major cities and not just along uh, borderlands and states, um, state boundaries. And yet, and here the limitations of the think-based approach become evident. Even people who do possess such material objects as passports may find that these are deemed worthless. In many countries anyway, that to use an expression of a Senegalese philosopher, their passports do not pass any ports. And that are not and that not see all seemingly equal material and documentary devices hold the same value. Not all passports, as we know, hold the same value. Or that their perfectly legal papers, their passport or pink card or whatever, can become worthless in the eyes of a racist policeman or guard who can confiscate them and even destroy them in front of their own eyes, declare them fake. What determines, after all, is the fate of the migrant, undocumented or not, are more basic, more visceral, sensorial matters. The color of the skin, the color of the hair, clothes, bodily odor, pronunciation. In the vast anti-migration, anti-migrant operation launched, launched in Athens, in Greece, in 2012, and ironically called hospitable zoos. Sensorial matters such as skin color and appearance were the criteria that police used to round up many thousands of people. And yet, only a tiny minority of them were proved to be undocumented migrants. This sensorial race, racial profiling is regularly used by immigration officers in, in airports and in many, in many northern countries, when um, we regularly see, when we travel ourselves as scholars, we regularly see people of dark skin to be asked to step out of the line for further questioning. Bodily odor has been long known to be a ground and a feature of sensorial racism. And in the cases of undocumented migrants, on a road or on a boat for endless days, if not for months, this order-based sensorial racism is routinely in vogue, very often in popular discourses or just in banal racism of everyday life. But take a look at this picture from an Athenian newspaper in Greece. Policemen regularly wear white surgical gloves when handling migrants in European city streets. This is in Athens. This is not a practice that is reserved for all suspects of an illegal act, however. So have a look at this picture. In this slide, the Greek police handling the leaders of a neo-Nazi group, the notorious Golden Dawn, did not see it essential to wear such gloves 
an easy and to some extent valid explanation for this can be that the migrants consider as a matter of place, a foreign polluting body from which not only the specific policeman but also the national body as a whole needs to be immunized and protected. And as the Italian philosopher Roberto Esposito has claimed, the logic of immunity, which he juxtaposes to the logic of community, immunity community, is the basis of, as we know, fascist and Nazi ideologies, which were after all, um, in essence, biology realized. So this biopolitical logic is to be found everywhere in the public discourse regarding migrants. And right-wing politicians and the conservative press would often rage against the perceived threats from diseases that come with undocumented migration. But I argue that there is more to this act of immunization and that of sensorial, um, uh, and that the sensorial archaeology in fact can, uh, can uh, go much further in explaining this specific phenomenon and understanding this sensorial racism we see here in front of our eyes. And I will come back to this in a minute. But I want to leave the present for a moment and transport you to another context. And I'll come back to this after this um, more conventional archaeological example. I would like to transport you to a different uh, setting, to a North European context, and of course the BM, the British Museum in London in the UK. Several of you, you know, I'm sure, that in 1937 to 38, the sculptures known as the Parthenon or Elgin Marbles, originally from the Acropolis of Athens, experienced a rather dramatic episode in their long and eventful life. They were about to be rehoused in the newly constructed Davin Gallery of the British Museum, named after Lord Davin, the person um, who funded the construction of that specific gallery. Now, Lord Davin was not keen on patina, especially the patina accumulated on the Parthenon marbles, giving them a honey-like color and a human skin-like texture and appearance. These works were not white enough for him. Dirty looking almost. Not what the Western middle classes and their elites had in mind when they thought of the glory that was Greece, to use a, a stereotypical expression. That is the golden age, of course, of Western civilization according to the popular discourses. So here we are seeing chronophobia, we are seeing a bipolarity between purity and pollution, but also the commingling of the aesthetic and the political. Thus, bring forward seven scrapers, one chisel, and a piece of carborundum stone as a sharpening tool, and the marbles became whiter than white, whiter than they had ever been in their long biography. Now, in the same context, fast forward um, 56 year, years in the early March of 1994. And we are in the very same room in the Ving Gallery. And this is a grainy image from a newspaper, a Greek newspaper. So here we have an impromptu gathering inside this gallery, the Ving Gallery, a commemoration of sorts, a commemorative occasion of sorts, staged shortly after the death of Melina Mercuri, who, as you know, is the Greek Minister of Culture who, has, um, who had spearheaded the campaign for the persecution, the repatriation of the Parthenon marbles. In this case, despite the protestations of the guards, the congregation manages to leave flowers on the exhibited sculptures. But in this photo, I want to draw your attention to the fact that this man you see here um, in fact, he's reaching out, he's, he's crossing the rope, he's crossing the material and the symbolic border, disre disregarding the imperative at the heart of conservation and museum displays the world over, from the British Museum to the site of the Acropolis itself, do not touch the marble. 
In this case, it was the mutuality of touch that these people were longing for. The cancelling of the object and subject divide, touching the skin of the marble and at the same time being touched by it. This is the touch that in some ways demolishes what I call in the book the museum of sensorial absence. And we can uh, spell absence into different ways, absence and ab slash sense. These two episodes are intricately linked, and not just because of the same location, both in the British Museum, and the material objects, of course, at the center, the bathroom marbles. I've claimed elsewhere in the Nation in Ruins book that in the long and emotive debate on the lives and fates of these objects, the sculptures themselves had become and have become personified beings, sentient entities that are seen as imprisoned in a dark Northern European gallery, demanding their return to the homeland. This is a trope in many popular discourses about this. And as such, the dramatic scraping in the 1930s constituted nothing less than their skinning, the removal of their honey-colored skin. Now, this skinning did not only deprive them from their largest sensory organ, that is the skin, but also from their ability to communicate with other fellow sentient beings and entities through touch, through tactile affectivity. And yet, this is what this visitor on the photograph was attempting to do, to reactivate and reignite this tactile affective communication with a material sending being not only in prison, but also out of bounds and behind the metal barrier imposed by the museum authorities. Now, in, um, in a long historiographic chapter in the book, I'm claiming that um, Western modernity is haunted. It's ha is haunted by the bodily senses because it is through them that all human action and experience becomes possible. At the same time, however, their corporeal nature, their unpredictability, their unruly and anarchic tendencies cause anxiety, tension, and fear. What is at stake is the very nature and definition of the person and what it means to be human. Western modernity gave rise to the fantasy and the delusion of the autonomous human, the fearless individual, the self-sustained and self-producing entity that could rule over sensibilities, could tame and conquer sensorial experience at the same time in the same way as it could colonize, tame, and conquer other people, faraway places, and chronologically distant realms, like in archaeology. Sensorial experience, it was thought, could be regimented, ordered along a hierarchical and classificatory grid, and at the same and the same goes for non-human beings, for plants, for animals, but also races, places, nations. It was this mentality which valorized the so-called distant senses, disembodied and autonomous vision and hearing, the senses of discourse the senses of logos, the senses that an autonomous and individuated body could relate to. It is, in some ways, remote sensing, as we call it in archaeology, to use a um, technological metaphor here. Throughout the history of the discourse on the senses, the specter of animality surfaces time and again. The fear that too much emphasis and reliance on smell, on touch, on taste could jeopardize your humanity. It could make you an animal or bring you closer to inferior colored races, which for much of Western modernity amounted to the same thing. And here is another connection with the migration vignette 
I started with. In many global contexts today, animal metaphors are used to denote undocumented migrants, but also their smugglers. Coyote for the smuggler and Polos, you know, you know, for the undocumented migrant in the Mexico US border. Or Shetu, which means snake head for the smuggler, and Renshe, snake for the crossing migrant in Chinese. Whereas Iranian, Iranians use the term for sheep, referring to a border crosser. As the social anthropologist and once undocumented migrant himself, uh, Shahran um, Kosravi notes, and I quote, represented in terms of chicken and sheep, two animals traditionally sacrificed in rituals, the border uh, transgressors are sacrificial creatures for the border rituals, end of quotation. I would add here that in these discourses, the migrants' sensorial capabilities and sensibilities are deemed also closer to animals than humans. Much of the thinking and the discourse on the senses in recent centuries took place against the background of colonialism. And here is the irony. Colonialism relied on the desire to acquire things from elsewhere, things that would enhance and could enhance and diversify and enrich bodily sensorial experiences. Think of spices, of coffee or tea, or tobacco, or chocolate, or a range of fr fruit and vegetables. Um, Chris Gosden, a fellow archaeologist in the UK, says, colonialism is about the grip that things hold on people. It may be about regimentation, regulation, control, and subjugation of place and people, but it is also about the desire for sensorial stimulation and strong experiential effects, the desire to acquire these commodities that enhance sensorial experience. And yet, the sensorial cornucopia that was unleashed with colonialism had to be tamed by sensorial order and classification, and at times, by sensorial racism. The sensorial is at the same time political and has been so um, always. Modernist archaeology, to return to our field, wanted to tame distant time, to colonize faraway places, and to prove the antiquity and the material truths of the nation. Within the realm of the autonomous and disembodied gaze, it produced its own object of desire. We call it the archaeological record out of the material traces and fragments of the past. To be more precise, if we are to agree with Heidegger and modernity produced the world as picture, modernist archaeology produced the world as object, an entity that was more of a philosophical concept than of material reality, an entity separate from the subject's um, autonomous human, and one that could be engaged through the distant senses and primarily autonomous vision. Instead of presence, modernist archaeology, at least in its dominant guises, opted for representation. Representation. Instead of material things, it opted, it opted for mostly anesthetic objects. Objects that could be rendered legible and visible entities, put up on a pedestal, admire from a distance, and then framed through a series of representational devices, the flat drawing, the photograph, the computer screen, and of course the remote sensing and scanning technologies, including 3D and other technologies we have today. But it is a quality of thingness in the thing which continues to haunt the discipline. It is the memory of the physical interaction with humans, the tactility in the evocation of lost but not forgotten auditory, olfactory, and gustatory worlds, to do with taste, which continue to disturb the sleep of dominant modernist archaeology. Things will not rest until they get their sensorial dues. Now, in um, 
in a chapter in the middle of his book, I attempt to summarize the main argument and propose some ideas based on all the previous discussion and uh, on a work, um, on work by archeologists, anth ethnographers, anthropologists, philosophers, and others. And these are in some way theses, principles um, uh, for what I consider to be archeology span of the senses. And I will try to summarize some of the most important ones here. How can we, how are we to develop a framework for a sensorially inspired archeology? span It's not an easy question, of course. And in grappling with this question for the past 10 years at least, if not more, and getting deeper into philosophical debates, I arrived at the conclusion that the exploration of the senses is not merely about bodily experience. It's not about organs, sensory organs, and the mechanics of bodily stimuli. It is rather an inquiry on the essence of being, on life, and also on the nature of subject-object and mind-body dichotomies, which as we know, are at the center of a much of philosophy. To inquire thus on the possibilities and on the shape of the archaeology of the senses means to inquire on the ontology of the discipline. What is archaeology after all? My first conclusion on the basis of my exploration in the book is that the senses are not five, the senses are infinite. Critical historiographies on the senses, as well as several anthropological studies, have shown that the sensorium we inhabit, or we at least recognize in our discourses, with its five senses and its implicit hierarchy, is in fact what we can call a folk taxonomy, a context-specific taxonomy, which was given to us, we inherited from uh, at least classical antiquity, from Aristotle and others. It was a way of imagining the body and the self, an imagery which um, in colonial and national modernity took on a very rigid form. This prevailing conception of the sense in Western modernity, however, carried certain class connotations, especially in more recent times. It had mostly to do with the upper classes, with middle classes, whereas there were other subaltern sensorial regimes that defined sensory hierarchy, that defied sensory hierarchy and compartmentalization. And of course, as we know, the fixity and the regimentation of the senses has been challenged in late modernity, especially since the beginning of the 20th century, by new social forces, new technologies, and new configurations of materiality. We can think of new social forces, the working class movements, feminist philosophy, philosophies, uh, environmental and other philosophies, but also new technologies. Think of uh, not only um, photography, but also more recent technologies such as cinema and other uh, technologies. So, things can be described, and this is fundamental um, for the thesis of the book, can be described as extensions of the human body, and they can act as sensorial prosthesis. Now, this is not to devalue them, devalue their power and agency, but rather to foreground and highlight their ability to enable the body to expand its sensorial capabilities. And since things were and are infinite, sensorial modalities can also be described as infinite. In, in this book, I discuss some of these sensorial modalities which are not part of our own recognized sensorium of the five senses based on anthropology and the work of other people. The sense of balance, uh, the sense of movement, what we call uh, kinesthesia. The sense of cinema. Some people say that cinema, cin the cinematic experience or the cinematic field is a different story modality. They call it synesthesia with C, not S. And we can go on adding, um, for example, the sense of place, the specific experiential mode associated with the emplacement of human action 
it's grounding in specific locales. The familiarity with which, uh, which, with which that grounding brings, the almost instinctive and automatic sense of sensorial recognition of paths, of roots, of place features. The gathering and the harboring of memories by places, as we know from um, phenomenological philosophers, places gather and harbor memories. All sensorial experiences thus are not only synesthetic, that is, work together in unison, but also kinesthetic, that is, they involve the movement as well as the commingling and the combined work of um, every sense. By the way, this is um, another different view of um, the Athenian Acropolis uh, in Athens. And I'm showing it to you because I think this, um, this um, sensorial photograph conveys a different uh, aesthetic appreciation of the place that is based on movement and is based on tactility. This is the rock, this is the bedrock of the site, a bedrock that has been exposed because of years and years and years of um, clearing, um, excavation, but also removal of all post-classical traces and finds on the Acropolis. And of course then the exposed bedrock has been polished because of the millions of feet that have been stepped on it. So by photographing not the monument but the ground, the bedrock, we can evoke through photography the sense of movement, the sense of history as demolition, as clearing, as purification, but at the same time as tactility. So gaze here and tactility, I think, mingle and work together. Sensorial modalities thus are not um, infinite, not, not, are infinite, not only because of the infinity of things, but also of the infinite number of contextual situations and locales where sensorial experience takes place. This is um, an, a website set up by uh, colleagues um, and it's called the Sixth Sense Ab Abecedarium. The purpose of this is to collect different modalities that are not recognized by conventional uh, Western understanding of the senses, and yet they can be considered as, as different modalities. So people um, are adding this list to the right, as you can see, uh, the film sense, um, the internet, kinesthesia, the sense of deja vu that is of course recognized by philosophers and others. The implications of the above thesis, the thesis that senses are infinite, for archaeology are immense. In the same way that anthropologists have identified sensorial modalities unrecognized by the Western sensorium, archaeologists having primary access to the materiality of the world through time, to the infinite number and range of things and technologies, can unearth and explore sensorial modalities which have been ignored and suppressed by Western modernist archaeology and other discourses. But given the synesthetic character of sensoriality, this will have to be done without resorting to the enumeration, the numbering, or the singularization, singling out one, and the compartmentalization of the sensorial. Now, several of you may know that the senses have been explored and investigated as part of what we call the bodily term in a number of disciplines the exploration of the human body in various um, archaeology, anthropology, philosophy, and all these disciplines. And I would say that despite the fruitfulness of this approach, there is a danger that lacks in the essentialism, or the essentialism of the body as a bounded entity, as an autonomous and bounded entity, and as an object. In the Archaeology of the Senses book, I have deliberately avoided making the body the main analytical category, the main category in my, uh, in my book, in my analysis. And I have shifted attention instead to sensoriality and to corporeality as conditions of embodiment. And I prefer the term transcorporeality, transcorporeality as the condition of sensorial flows 
in shifting corporeal landscapes, which also include things. So not one autonomous body, but a landscape of bodies that can be actually thought transcorporeally as kind of entities through which flows of sensorial experience and memory pass. So this is a shift from a body or from the thing to the field of sensoriality, the field of experience, and to a carnal materiality. It is a materiality, it's a carnal materiality, which recognizes that a unifying element of bodies, organisms, things, environments, and landscapes is what uh, the philosopher Merleau-Ponty has called the flesh of the world, the flesh of the world. The sensorial character and nature which comes to life through this transcorporeal and affective engagement. The affectivity is important, as I'll show in a minute. So if this is an ontology, it's not, not an ontology of things, but of sensorial flows and movements, not of bodies, but of corporeal landscapes, of transcorporeality, not of a single action or a sing single actions, but of continuous in their animation. Now, we know, of course, that the body is an organism. But at the same time, the body extends itself beyond the organic. Since the senses, despite their functional roles, are not absolutely essential, necessary for the organic body to operate. The notion of the flow is of primary importance here. It refers to flows of materials, of information, of substances, of memories, affectivities, affects, airborne particles, bodily fluids, ideas, rays of light, waves of sound. But there is always a dialectic in operation between fluidity and fixity, between sensorial flows and interactions on the one hand and the objectification and regulation of the sense. We constantly try ourselves, but also institutions, to actually regulate and regiment that constant flow of sensorial interactions. And the same applies to sensorial and bodily memories, which, are another, which is another concept very important in this exploration. Archaeological sites, for example, reshaped by us archaeologists and reconstituted as archaeological record out of the material traces or fragments of the past are examples of such an attempt to objectify, to fix, to regulate, aimed at producing and perpetuating a consensual order. But these attempts are constantly at risk. They are subject to the, what some people call, involuntary mnemonic effects. To the efforts, to the subaltern efforts, to disrupt the concept, consensus and to produce dissensual effects. So if the senses are not essential for the workings of the organic body, what is the primary role? Well, sensoriality shapes and organizes social life. And perhaps more importantly, and this is a key concept for me, activates and evokes affectivity. The, sense, the senses enable the body to be affected. We are affected by sensorial stimuli, not only organically, physically, but in an emotive manner, in a kind of feeling manner. They allow us to be touched, both you know, uh, uh, literally, but also uh, metaphorically, to be moved, again, literally and metaphorically. Sensoriality thus cannot be separated from affect. Affectivity and affect should be central to sensoriality. And here I part from colleagues who do archaeology and the senses in an objectified manner. For example, exploring the acoustic properties of a cathedral or a building using um, mechanical, scientific, or other instrumental devices. Uh, what I'm saying is that you cannot do an archaeology of the senses without examining at the same time the affective role of the sensorial, the ability of the senses to move us to touch us. Now, if that is the case, recall the vignette I started with, recall the policemen in European cities 
wearing white surgical gloves, when handling migrants, but not when handling other subjects, subjects, suspects like the neo-Nazis. What they were doing here was they were not simply immunizing themselves and by extension the nation from a foreign polluting body. They were also avoiding skin to skin contact. They were refusing to engage in a directly tactile communication with a migrant, with otherness, with the other. They were immunizing themselves from any potential affective bonds that would have developed between themselves and the undocumented migrants. And it is affect rather than emotion, another similar concept, that I want to foreground here. Making the, mo mo making the most of the ability of the word affect to function both as a verb, to affect, but also as a noun, the affect, the result of that action. As such, affect bypasses the dichotomy between subject and object and connects with the sensorial field as a space where flows and encounters are happening as a, what I call, sensorial conduct zone sensorial conduct zone. It is through affectivity that sensorial flows and interactions animate the flesh of the world. An archaeology of the sense is that cannot but be at the same time an archaeology of affect, an archaeology of affectivity. Another fundamental concept in the book is its, this, its ideas about time and temporality. And the main principle that I want to explain in, uh, for a minute is that the senses are multi-temporal. They do not belong to one time. They belong to multiple times at once. They activate the multi-temporality of matter. And this discussion is based on my, my reading and understanding of uh, Bergson, a philosopher that is becoming more and more known again. The sensorial approach which I'm advancing here does not subscribe thus to the chronometric device, the objectivist time of modernity, um, but sees time in is instead as durational and as immanent to sensorial experience. And let me show you um, two examples that I also discuss in the book to actually make the point about uh, materiality, multi-temporality, and the senses. The first image is um, it's a piece of stone, it's a block, it's an architectural block, in fact, from the sanctuary of Poseidon on the island of Poros, the ancient name is Calabria, Calauria, in the Saronic Gulf in, in Greece, a site where I've done ethnographic work for, for three years, and a site I know intimately. So amidst the ruins of the sanctuary, there is this ancient, uh, possibly fourth century BC, limestone block, which was part of a wall of a stoa, of one of the buildings that surrounded the, the temple in antiquity. And the block has been in place since, um, since antiquity, but at the end of the 19th century, a large extended family settled amidst the ruins. It built a farmstead and made this their home until they were evicted from the archaeological service in, in 1978 when the site was declared archaeological site and, and uh, site to be protected. Um, the children of the family would play amongst this, the ruins and would inscribe the, on the rough surface of the stone their initials as they did with um, you know, other stones on the site. So you can see initials here you can see initials here. Uh, here you have the Greek letters Vita, Gamma, Me. And in fact, through ethnography, we can identify these people. So we can name who this person is. Vangelis, Georgiou, Macris. Another name. Uh, Gamma, Me, again the same. Georgiou, Macris. So the father's name and the same name the same. So these are the children belonging to the same family. And you can also see... Um, dates, which was the date of birth, 1952 here, and you can see an inscription here which says Eton 14, 14 year old. 
So initial date of um, of birth uh, and um, date, which would be date of birth of the baby when they described it, and their age. Um, let's uh, keep this in mind for the moment and move to another locale, which I think will come up in a minute, um, from a different site, the site of the Athenian Acropolis um, in, uh, in Athens. Now, this is uh, quite a large photo, but uh, hopefully it will load in a minute. So, I don't know what's happening. This graph. <laughs> Technology. I don't know why it's taking for so long for the image to load. Huh? I've done it several times, but it doesn't actually work. I don't know whether it's stuck in here. Do you want to come and have a look? Sorry for the... Uh -huh. I guess it has to do with the mouse, because I used the mouse for the first time. Oh, maybe. Ah, okay. I should activate the mouse. Thank you. So uh, this is the, um, the second example on the stone that, um, again, I'm discussing in the book. Um, what you are seeing here is uh, architectural fragments from the Acropolis. Um, it is from the Temple of Erechtheum. Erechtheum uh, originally dated to the classical period broadly defined, the 5th century BC in particular. But the important thing here is the inscribing of this specific globe by um, an Arabic inscription, Ottoman inscription in Arabic script to be more precise, which was carved on this block in 1805, when the Acropolis, of course, was under Ottoman rule and used as a fortress. The block was then embedded in one of the vaulted entrances to the Acropolis. The inscription, in case you are interested, um, praises the governor of Athens, the Ottoman governor of Athens, and his achievement in fortifying the Acropolis. Now, I have discussed this um, piece in a couple of places uh, in relation to material memory as an example of um, working, uh, reworking the multi-temporal past. But here I want to discuss it briefly in connection with the entanglement of sensoriality with material memory and with time. And the question I'm posing to you and to myself and to us is, what time are these objects? How can we date these two pieces using our own conventions of chronological time, of successive time? Is this fragment from the Acropolis ancient or early 19th century? Is it dated to the 5th century BC or to 1805 when you have this reused inscription on the top? Is the other fragment I showed you from Calabria, from uh, the Poseidon sanctuary, is it of the classical date, the 4th century BC, or is it from the 20th century when you see them inscribe their names on it? So here we have a problem. You know, that continuous animation and use of these things, in fact, uh, makes our chronological thinking and our chronometric time problematic. So that's, this is where I have come to the thought of Bergson, and also in the Deleuzian, on a Deleuzian take on Bergson. And I think in that body of thinking, we can find some important insights in our attempt to understand the implications of these things and practices for temporality. Bergson, as you many of you may know, problematized the relationship between matter, memory, and time, a thinking that allows us to think beyond the linearity and the modernist conception of time as accumulation, as a cumulative process. And in modernity, we very often, at least in our official discourses, we encounter time as linear, as successive, as cumulative, and as irreversible, yeah? as, a, as a train, as a train that uh, travels down a line. Now, this is the chronological and chronometric time, a mentality which is reminiscent of the modernist idea of progress, of a linear process of advancing forward, the humanity advances forward in time. Bergson instead developed the notion of durational time, experiential time, mnemonic time. 
based on the link between matter and temporality. And on his thesis, and this is very crucial for us in relation to the senses, his thesis is that every perception of the present moment is replete with memories. Every time we perceive something, there are memories in that perception embedded in it, built in it, contained in our moment of perception. So he recognized that a fundamental property of matter is its duration, its ability to last. As such, it embodies various times at once, the time of its original creation, production, as well as all other moments and instances, such as the time of its subsequent modification and redeployment, and the time of its reanimation and reactivation by sensorial and experiential processes. So past and present are not, according to this thinking at least, not successive moments in a line, but rather coexist side by side in the same way that every sensorial perception is at the same time past and present. They are thus both modalities or dimensions of duration, as a feminist philosopher and specialist on Brexton, Elizabeth Goss, has put it in, in, in her own study of the philosopher. In that sense, every given present carries with it all pasts, but of course, we select. It is through the selective process of memory that only specific pasts are conjured up at any specific moment. Yeah? Memory, as we know, is a selective process, broadly defined memory, including archaeological memory. So our two arch architectural blocks embody such a conception of time in an immediate and indirect way. Our archaeology, our modernist archaeology, through dating techniques, fix things into a certain moment in the past, often prioritizing the initial production and the genesis of these things at the expense of the other moments in their biography. In that case, these two fragments are dated conventionally to the classical era broadly defined. Archaeology as a mnemonic practice, however, has chosen to, in this case, to selectively remember the instant of the classical. Here, when we discuss this in conventional uh, discussions in the museum, in classical archaeology, we call it a classical architectural sculpture. We remember, in this case, one moment that is the classical. The reshaping that is of this piece of geology, think of the durational geological time as well embedded in this um, stone, into architectural blocks and used, of course, in temples and sacred buildings during classical antiquity. In both cases, they were linked to classical temples, Erechtheum, Poseidon. So, as such, the subsequent moments in their life, the time of the Ottoman use of the Acropolis, and the time of the 19th century and then 20th century when the sanctuary was used as a farmstead, were deliberately, as I'm, I'm suggesting, deliberately forgotten. But, and here's the but, and here's the retribution, kind of the, uh, the power of things, that material memories are not really that easy to completely erase. Their durational qualities allow them to intervene in the present. These fragments, as all material things, are multi-temporal. Their multiple temporal instances include all moments in which these uh, fragments became the center of sensorial attention, and acted as participants in corporeal engagements and interactions. When I, we encounter, I encountered this fragment um, for the first time on the Acropolis, was half buried in, rub, in rubble, um, and it was condemned to invisibility because it was not part of an itinerary of tourists, was not part of a, a, the official projection of the site. So it was rather condemned to oblivion, um, and yet, um, and by the way, the fate of it today is unknown. In more, more recent visit to the Acropolis, I could not even locate it in that uh, original position I found it. And yet, through the photographing, and a colleague of mine has photographed this now several times, and also in our um, projection of this piece in, let's say, projects such as this one, which is a photo blog we call The Other Acropolis, 
the aim of which is to uh, foreground and highlight all these other materialities of the Acropolis monument and site, which are not part of the official um, projection of the site. So through these, through these th pro projections, it has acquired a new visibility, that is, a new sensorial prominence. Now, the same applies to the block I showed you from the Calabria site in Poros. In this case, the fragment and its multi-temporal qualities forced us to not only to notice it, but also to record it, to draw it, and also make it an essential part of our own guided tours on site. So groups of visitors would gather around it and hear about the various temporal moments of that um, stone. They would photograph it often and trace with their own hands the engraved letters on that stone. So this art, that artifact, continued living not only through these sensorial engagements, but also in a literal, organic sense, through erosion, through decay, and through the legends, the vegetation that has colonized these groups of the inscriptions. In a few years' time, that inscription, of course, will be decipherable only through the sense of touch, only by touching, because vegetation and legends are going to colonize most of the groups. So, the senses are multi-temporal. They are part of the present, pa they, are part, they are past and present at the same time, and they entail the simultaneous coexistence and communion of perception and memory. Furthermore, if the duration qualities of matter and act and activate multiple times, then such enactments become possible through multisensorial engagements involving materiality, and more broadly, what I referred to before, a quote in Merleau-Ponty, the flesh of the world. Now, this thesis entails that the recasting of archaeology, and I know that there's going to be resistance amongst my colleagues and our colleagues, the recasting of archaeology as multi-temporal, corporeal, and sensorial practice. Such a new discipline, then, it will be attentive, and attention here is important, sensorial attention is important, attentive to the sensorial lives of things and materials as multi-temporal entities, attentive to the risky and unpredictable nature of the sensorial, and of course to the political lives of matter, that is, um, the coexistence of multiple times simultaneously would render problematic the use of archaeology as a refuge as an escape to a distant past and to a remote past, to a harmless past. I do only the fifth century BC. I do not care about the other moments, or I do only prehistory. Well, tough, because every, every material object can, uh, is at the same time past and present. So after this rather long uh, discussion, I want to uh, finish with a final vignette final short and very, very brief expose or exploration of one of the case studies I analyze in the book um, at a greater length and detail. And this is from my own context of expertise and interest, which is the Bronze Age of Crete, uh, what we call Minon Crete, although I don't like the term Minon, um, to uh, see how a specific part of material culture, and more specifically wall paintings, frescoes, from, uh, primarily from Knossos, can actually um, help us rethink this specific context as sensorial, as multisensorial, and as a, an example of a sensorial archaeology. So, one of the most impressive and iconic uh, categories of material culture of Bronze Age Crete is um, the frescoes, a series of elaborate, multicolored, and complex works executed through uh, the technique of the painting on, on, on wet lime plaster, as you, as you know. Um, they adorn holes, but occasionally other parts of architectural space, such as floors. Both the specific technique and the iconographic themes portrayed have rendered these works as some of the most recognizable features of the Bronze Age uh, of Crete. Now, uh, polychromy, of course, was not something new at that time. It was common in pottery, at least, pottery decoration, but also architecture, from um, what we call the first palace period, from at least the second millennium BC. 
and continued um, to develop further in subsequent periods. Kamar is where, uh, for some of you that know the, the, you know, the material culture of that, uh, of that um, place. So wall painting was not something um, completely new. And even the house walls of the early Bronze Age, of the third millennium BC, were covered uh, often with red ochre. But the later periods of the palaces, the period of the new palaces, 1500 BC roughly, signaled a number of innovations, including the appearance of figurative representations, human figures on the walls. Despite their limited, relatively limited occurrence, we don't have that many sites with wall paintings, but may they have been more that we haven't actually unearthed and discovered. The stunning sensorial impact of the wall paintings command our attention. I'd rather go back here. In most interpretive attempts to date, these works have been invested with a modernist discourse on art, on visibility and visuality, that is, the discourse of autonomous vision or separate vision or something to be admired if it was a painting in a modern gallery. They are treated um, as modern paintings destined for decorative purposes, you know, on the walls for decoration, for my knowns to admire, for my knowns to, to um, appreciate their own painters and their own sensorial world. Um, the study, of course, of these wall paintings has advanced significantly in recent years, and several of my colleagues have, have done important work on this. But yet, the meanings, what they call the meanings of these works, eludes us, escape us. The invocation of religious significance by some researchers does not offer any further clues, especially since it is almost, uh, it is almost impossible to designate a separate and autonomous religious domain in the Bronze Age of Crete. The religious from the secular is something we cannot really separate in that context. Instead of the repeated search for abstract meaning, an exercise which is inscribed within the mind and body dichotomy and the Cartesian heritage of archaeology, I propose an approach here which attempts to understand the sensorial impact and the role of these things, their positions within the spaces of communal embodied performance, which characterized palatial and other contexts at the time. Now, for example, a look at the distribution within the Gnosian palace of the neopalatial uh, period, we reveal that passages, corridors, and staircase stairways, that is, spaces which were linked with regulated bodily movement, processions, and other bodily movement, were adorned with some of the most impressive wall paintings, often depicted such um, ordered bodily movement. Moreover, very often these wall paintings seem to envelop the spectator, creating a total environment. They can be described thus as participatory. They were things that they were participating in a human action inside spaces. Many fragments of these works were found in what we call fresco heaps. Yeah? They lack any signs of burning as well, which means that they come from a deliberate attempt to, to scrape the wall painting off the wall. That is, the deliberate destruction of these things, the removal of these things off the walls. This indicates that at least some of them were not permanent works of art to be there constantly for decoration, but they were perhaps some of them at least transient media. Yeah? Perhaps put up as props for specific important events and ceremonies. An example that is well known from the literature is the, you know, the so-called throne room from Knossos, in this case dated to um, you know, period called LM2, which is a good example of such enveloping of the participants and the function of the wall paintings as props for rituals. And the so-called throne room is of course a three-dimensional, uh, there's a three-dimensional stone seat uh, in the middle of it, and it's flanked by two griffins, griffins, which are the side of the flat surface of the wall. Now, the most common ex commonly accepted explanation in this case is rituals of epiphany, that this room was used for rituals of epiphany that were taking place in this, in this space. 
These wall paintings, therefore, were not independent step decorative features, but formed a unity with the architecture and its sensorial and embodied affordances. They were thus tightly linked to the social practices and ceremonies performed and enacted in these architectural spaces. They were, as I said, participatory works. Let's, uh, let me follow, for example, two uh, specific examples, um, for a moment, two specific examples, to actually show you some of the things that uh, I've been talking about. Um, the first is what is called the procession fresco, a major work located on both the east and the west walls of the corridor near the main passageway for people entering the palace from the west. So this is a, um, a graphic um, representation of it, a drawing of the whole procession uh, with the vein in its entirety. And it was um, close to um, the west and west court that you can see here on this, on this slide. So the open, the open paved um, space, and this is a photograph of that open paved space of the west court, was an arena of ceremony and performance. We know that within this designated foot, um, um, footpaths, and you can see some on this slide, regulated bodily movement. You, you see an open space, but you can notice that in fact certain uh, paths were designated on that open space to regulate the bodily movement of people in a procession, in a very regimented manner, regimented kinesthetic experiences, leading um, through that um, procession into the west porch and through that into dark and very narrow, but clearly lavishly adorned walls with paintings, the corridor of the procession. Now, the painting was found on the walls in a fragmentary condition and depicts a series of human figures in procession, some carried liquid, uh, carrying liquid containers. In a nearby um, corridor, um, another um, example of wall painting, this one, the Cabaret fresco, of the same date, which is, as you can see, a human figure which is uh, part of another procession, again carrying uh, containers with liquids, um, or rita for perhaps libations and other ritual activities. Um, the portion of the synthesis occupying the south part of this wall depicts a seemingly female figure, you can see here on the reconstruction, paper reconstruction, which acts as the focus of the whole procession and performance. You can see how the other figures are oriented vis-a-vis -vis that central female figure. Most of the upper parts of these figures are missing, but the most authoritative reconstruction, the most accepted reconstruction, which is this one by uh, the British uh, Mark Cameron, portrays several of these figures as playing musical instruments, such as the lyra, the flutes, and also the sistra, um, the well-known um, rattle uh, of Egyptian origin. You can see this from a, a stone relief vessel um, from another context. The other example I want to show you briefly, and this is just uh, based on a paper reconstruction because the, you know, the synthesis does not actually exist as a whole or part, is what we call the Grand Staircase Fresco, dating to the near palatial period and has been found scattered in debris in the east wing of the palace. It depicts humans in procession ascending a staircase to the left. The suggested reconstruction is set against the background of a monumental grand staircase which connected the clusters of the rooms to the east side of the palace arranged in two floors and we can call residential quarter. But more importantly connected, as you can see here, this is the grand staircase, connected, um, you know, the covered, closed, um, I limit, can limiting and uh, you know, restricted parts of the palace to the open space of the central court. And to return to the actual reconstruction, one of the figures who ascends, walks up the staircase, carries a lotus flower. And as you can see here, the reconstructor Cameron assumes other media, players of musical instruments again, and carriers of food and drink vessels. Now, in both cases, the wall paintings were positioned in transitional context from open courtyards to more restricted spaces. This is particularly so in the case of the procession fresco, where the transition is from the west court 
a context of interface between the palace and the town. The transitional character also, to some extent, evident in the second case, this one, because of the position on the grand staircase which connects the central court, the open space, with the restricted residential quarter. This transition needs to be understood in both the aesthetic and the political sense, not only from light to dark, or the reverse, and from ceremonies and rituals open to large numbers of people to the ones that they were visually and orally restricted, but also from an open domain to the ungoverned by social exclusion and control. A clear illustration here of the convergence of the sensorial and the political. Due to the position in the narrow and possibly dark corridors and staircase, staircases, the wall paintings could not have been visually perceived in their entirety by a stark person, and this is important. They were thus sensorially received gradually and by moving bodies. You had to actually walk down the corridor to, to receive, to understand, to visually comprehend the whole synthesis. Perhaps walking in a similar regulated fashion as the people on the wall, in a regimented procession, a processional way. In the case of the procession fresco, which covered both sides of the wall, the human bodies would have been surrounded by the bodies on the wall, depicted at the eye level. So you can actually see bodies moving, bodies, but also you can see bodies moving on the wall painting. So we can talk here of a unified corporeal landscape which would have enveloped both the actual people walking down the corridor and the people depicted on each side of the corridor on the walls. Now, if these processions include musicians, as it's more likely, and possibly lit by, by, by artificial lighting, then the procession of the wall paintings would have been a truly multisensorial, kinesthetic, and synesthetic phenomenon. These images would have been corporeally perceived through the peripheral vision of moving bodies, through the glass, and the tactile vision, but at the same time, the production of sound from musicians would have regulated temporality, sound regulates movement, producing thus a collective transcorporeal sensorial experience. The movement of people in actual procession with the artificial flickering lighting would have created the impression, the illusion of moving figures on the wall. People would see these bodies on the wall, these depictions as moving bodies. In the same way that we actually in Byzantine churches today, lit by candles and lamps, we sometimes see the saints moving on the wall. People thus would have been participants in an elaborate and sensorially impressive act of prehistoric cinema, or perhaps synesthesia, recall the sense of cinema Anesthesia, synesthesia. As the sound produced by the actual musicians would have bounced off the walls, would have actually created the illusion that it comes from the depicted musicians. And here I want to use a term by a, um, a soundtrack specialist, Michel Kion, uh, and call these paintings um, um, as perceived by the sense of audiovision. Audiovision as a new sensory modality, as mixing the visual and the aural. According to him, audiovision is the perceptive process by which sound modifies and influences the perception of what is seen. Vision becomes something else because it actually merges with the aural. Or to put it more uh, accurately in my context, through performative kinesthetic audiovision. Now, the wall paintings thus were key components in sensorial assemblages, which included um, both the broader architecture, the actual human participants, and the objects and artifacts carried by them, but also the sounds, the music, the chant, the olfactory emissions from the flowers and from the food and drink, drink in the containers, both the actual ones and the ones depicted on these walls. 
And there's no coincidence that the Beatles figures, as I said, carry food containers or drink containers, implying that the procession could have perhaps led to some sort of ceremony of feasting or drinking events, such as the ones portrayed um, very often in, uh, in wall paintings. And of course, there is plenty of archeological evidence for the um, for uh, feasting events happening in many of these contexts, and we find very often um, drinking cups by the many thousand, sometimes 20,000 drinking cups, as in this case of this context that I was excavating with colleagues a few years back. So in other words, these highly elaborate visual representations were not just visual, and they were definitely not representations. They were multisensorial phenomena they regulated human movement and action, and at the same time, they were co-participants with humans in a process of inter-animation during embodied rituals and ceremonies. The fact that the humans depicted on the walls do not include any portraits, that is, they are generic humans, idealized forms of the human body, makes their participation in these ceremonies and the formation of social assemblages easier. So, after this um, whole discussion, I want to, to conclude briefly, very briefly, and return again to the contemporary and to the present. And I want to conclude by saying that the theory of sensoriality that I'm actually proposing here to you is, I think, anti-Cartesian, or at least against what uh, we conceived as, of as a Cartesian philosophical heritage, which had became, become dominant, at least in our discourses, in the, in the West. So instead of the usual phrase that we evoke, all of us evoke in uh, Descartes, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, I opt instead for the phrase by the romantic German philosopher Herder, I feel, therefore I am. And I want to remind us of Merleau-Ponty's phrase in relation to that, in relation to Descartes again, I am not what I think, but what I live through. So I'm defined not by thinking, but by experience, by living. Now, this does not imply that thinking uh, should be rejected, of course. I do not propose that. But what I'm actually saying is that we should reconstitute thinking as another form of felt experience, as sensorial and affective pra practice interwoven with all other embodied practices. That is, thinking through, thinking through the living and the sensing body. So it's still thinking, but affective thinking and through the body and through the experience of the body. So while things and materials are, are essential proper, the, the properties and components of the field of sensoriality, I don't want to fetishize the thing, to take the thing as a separate entity and make it the center of my attention. Uh, and I don't want to replace what we call the humanism of modernity with pragmatocentrism, with um, you know, making the object as the center of our attention. Instead of things, thus, I propose to you to make sensorial flows the center of our attention. And instead of entities, um, take our starting point, the movement and the interaction involving the flow and exchange of substances, of affects, of memories and of ideas. The field of sensoriality creates the conditions for assemblages, sensorial assemblages, to gather and to come into being. Assemblages that include heterogeneous elements, humans, other beings, stones, monuments, weather conditions, sound waves, and mnemonic recollections. This new field of engagement and practice can become an appropriate conduit through which we can question, in addition to archaeology, question the huge challenges that we actually face today in the contemporary world. And this is my final point that, in fact, learning from archaeology a new way of experiencing sensoriality and materiality, we can come back to the present and rethink our contemporary condition and our key problems today. So, for example, I started by arguing that we urgently need a global multisensorial archaeology of contemporary undocumented migration and archaeology of the refugees as well. 
But the sensorial archaeology can also analyze and deconstruct, effectively deconstruct, phenomena such as the increasing militarization of our lives, as new modalities of militarization, such as drone warfare, take hold. Now, if you think about it in drone warfare, we have the production of a new cultural optic, a new sensorial and affective regime, that is God's eye, it's a God's eye view, and it is an omnipresent and omnipotent eye capable of total surveillance, a drone that can actually see everything, but remaining most of the times invisible, or at least the operator of the drone, invisible because he is located somewhere else. What we are seeing here thus in terms of sensoriality is the coupling of the camera and the gun along with the remote operator, which constitutes a new very powerful sensorial assemblage that relies on emotional and affective distance. I can see you from a distance, I can kill you from a distance. So, finally, this ontological or ontogenetic shift that I am uh, proposing, and I think can be brought about by a multisensorial and by effective archaeology, constitutes a new challenge, a major challenge to the anthropocentric regime of our modernity. And thus, it could be an appropriate and effective tool, an effective and effective tool, for not only understanding our contemporary geological and social order, some people call it the Anthropocene, but also inventing new forms of multi-species, affective and multi-sensorial life. So looking also into the future. Thank you very much for listening your attention. Just, just a few, a few words. Uh, um, I'd like to know if, uh, if you have thought about the problem of the, the relations between your, your proposed sensorial yeah. archaeology and problems in the, in the current world between professional archaeologists and the public, and the general mm. public. Mm. I mean, uh, sensoriality is clearly related, clearly uh, confined, confined limit, limited to the... Uh, uh, the world of, of professional, to the professional world. No? The normal people has not uh, any access to any kind of sensorial relations to ancient, to archaeological things. The problem of uh, the Altamira cave, mm, which mm, is mm. To, to be open now to the public, yeah. to a small group of people, but it has to be also, of course, which has to be uh, pro protected and, and, and uh, laid to charge for the future, and pro charge for, uh, pro protected for the future, or enjoyed in the present, you know, or, or the problem of illegal uh, antiquities traffic. The, the, the owners of illegal antiquities who have their antiquities at their home, yes. they claim that they, they want to have a more sensorial and direct relationship to the things that, that, is, not com that is not limited or, or restrict, restricted only to professionals yeah. that, that exert a, a kind of, of uh, exclusiveness of exclusivity in their, in their approach to yes. the past. This, I think maybe uh, this kind of sensorial archaeology can help us to understand, to better understand people other than, than we, than we mm. are professionals. Mm. Uh, mm. The, the, the normal world, the world of the general public, which is different from the world of uh, museum curators, archaeologists, and scientists mm. in general. Mm. This is yes. the question. Thank you. Um, a very, very interesting matter and very complicated as well. And I'll try to give a, a brief comment on this. I, I, the relationship between pub various publics and archaeology or museums is in fact at the center of my attention here. Uh, I don't have case studies in museums, but I do have kind of discussions of museums. I discuss, for example, the New Acropolis Museum or other cases because I think we cannot discuss 
sensoriality only as a professional archaeological you know, matter. Why? Well, because many publics very, very often long for sensorial proximity. They want to touch things, as you say, you know, many as they want to come closer to these things. And of course, then you have various issues to consider, as you said. You have, first of all, the museographic practice of uh, having some distance, very often for conservation purposes. But I think it's, it's um, even within the world of conservation, there is now a discussion about tactility, for example, about the ability of publics to actually be allowed to touch. I am. Uh, I, 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 I have discussed this with many of my colleagues, including many conservators and others and museum people, and I am of the opinion that I think we should allow tactility to be activated as much as possible, especially since, as we know, we have lots and lots of interesting artifacts, objects in our storerooms that can be actually touched by people with no major problem of conservation, you know? Millions of pottery shards can be, in fact, touched by people without causing any major damage. There is this danger of always prolonging that sense of public appreciation. We say, we save this for posterity. We save this for the future. This is not for you, it's for the next generation. This is the future that never comes, yeah? It always postponed, always kind of, uh, it's not for you, wait, you know. I think there are issues here to consider um, seriously because in museums, uh, very often, we allow tactility for special, special people, special groups, people with impaired vision, for example, we sometimes do. We often allow children to touch things because we consider touching as a very important educational experience for kids. But you, we adults, are supposed to learn experience only by our minds, or primarily by our minds, or by our vision. Yes? Adults are logocentric. You know, the adulthood of humanity is theoretical, is logocentric. The childhood of humanity is sensorial, tactile, can play with things, but now you don't need to play because you are grown up. I think there are important matters here to consider, and I think several museums now allow, in fact, at tactility and more and more. And even in some archaeological sites, even if there is some, some um, uh, damage, some attrition, there is, there is a trade-off here that some damage, you know, always happen, things as we know live. They have biography, they change. Not to consider, for example, other ontologies in relation to things, consider indigenous groups in a number of contexts, Think of the American Southwest um, and a number of indigenous groups there that believe that many things need to be allowed to die, need to be allowed to be returned to the earth. So we are, we, we are stuck with a very distinctive ontology about touching, about sensorial experience, as was well very often a very professional um, zeal and desire to keep things only for ourselves. So, but I think that many of things I'm trying to say in fact, can operate as a springboard to discuss also museographic matters about museum and the public. I don't know whether. Um, thank you. And what do you think is the final goal of all of this? I mean, do you think that? with this, uh, you said feelings are timeless. So do you think we can really feel what, I don't know, people from Stonehenge, Stonehenge when they build it, if you have this experience there or something like that? No. Um, <laughs> we inhabit different bodies from the people of Stone Age or the people of the Neolithic or the people of the Bronze Age. And I'm not in fact trying with this perspective to recreate feelings uh, affectivities, or even sensorial experiences. You cannot. We do inhabit different worlds and different bodies. What we are trying to do in this, uh, what I'm trying to do in this, in this perspective, in this, this attempt is to evoke a range of sensorial and affective experience that has actually been present, activated in a specific context. I'm not saying the way I, I touch a, a, you know, a, a pot today 
is the same way as people in the past actually felt it or felt the same things as I felt it, I feel today. And in fact, the genealogical exercise of excavating our own sensoriality is the beginning point, the starting point of this book. I'm saying that if you are, if we are to do an archaeology of the senses, we cannot but start from excavating our own sensorial constitution. We have to understand how we have been shaped as sensorial beings before we allow our bodies to become the guide for other people for the sensorial of the past. So that's the first point. Because the senses are not universal, our education, you know, there's been an education of the senses and every context very often produces its own sensorial regime. But what I believe we can do is to evoke through various ways, through text, through iconography, through multiple media, the range of sensorial experiences that could have happened in a different context, both in the present and in the past. So it's not representation, not recreation of feeling, is um, evocation. Now, our own feelings is another matter. We can talk about the feelings, but not imply that this feeling can be projected to the feelings of people in the past. Thank you. Uh, in the same line, Victor was uh, training. Um, mm. I would like to ask, uh, what's your opinion on the importance of the senses, not only between professional archaeologists and the public, but within our, our own discipline? Like, for example, some scholars ha have claimed that the sight is one of the most important senses in our discipline, and this preeminence of sight can be seen while, while digging, for example, can mm. be seen in mus museography also. Mm. Um, uh, but, and also, for example, in conferences, for example, your presentation was very visual. Mm. Yeah. It was full of images, but there was not like a text supporting those images. So, for example, if I were, if I were deaf, I could not have been able to follow your arguments. So, um, like, are we creating a kind of borders within the discipline through the senses, for example, like who can access archaeology and mm. who can succeed in archaeology? For example, how many blind archaeologists do we know? Yeah, you're absolutely right. We do, in fact, with the, with, the, with the emphasis on the primacy of vision, we do exclude people, of course. Um, now, there's also the paradox that, you know, is at the center of archaeology, that we, we know that archaeology excavating, I think I disagree with you there, it's not just visual. As we know, excavation is multisensorial by, by definition. We, we involve all our senses, even the sense of touch, right? We recognize and categorize sediments, whether they are sandy, or you know, loamy by actually you know, tasting some of the sediment. So there are many different ways of involving all our body in the way we dig. When we come to write up what we actually excavate, that's where the problem starts because then we create an abstraction from that multisensorial experience of the dig, the field site, and we produce very often, as you say, visual discourses or in many cases just a logocentric abstract discourses because we think that it's about contemplation, just contemplation, and about um, an explanation as a theoretical um, matter, a philosophical matter, not about evoking sensoriality. Now, my talk used lots of visuals, but w I was talking, you know, I was, uh, you know, sound, of course, movement, I was moving all the time, my body was moving a lot. So was it was a multisensorial, I think, um, Lecture, but I take your other implicit point that one of the challenges we face is to um, experiment with diverse media and evoke what we are trying to evoke in terms of sensoriality by different ways, not just by text, not just by image, but through other ways. And there are there are very very interesting experiments at the moment in archaeology using, for example, photo essays. In many of our publications now, there are photo, there are journals that actually use the photo essay as an accepted way of communicating archaeological knowledge. Now, this was not something that was done in the past. We had a conventional article with lots, lots of images, photo essay, something else, using film, interestingly, in archaeology, or using uh, you know film ways of evoking the past. Multi-temporal, contemporary art is another way through which now archaeology is trying to engage, especially publics and other things. So I think there is enormous scope for all of us 
to actually engage with diverse media in an attempt to, to reverse on censoriality. You know, publications, of course, is, is something distinctive and there are the limits of the published book, but books even are you know, tactile. They, they smell as well, they have a distinctive smell, so even the book as an object can actually be seen as a multi, multi-sensorial artifact. No one else wants to, uh, nadie más quiere preguntar nada. Si tenéis vergüenza con el inglés, lo traducimos. Aprovechad, que ya se va y no vuelve. Hello, thank you. I thought it was very interesting, your um, thank you. topic. Um, I was aware that maybe uh, psychologists uh, separate the human being, the way to communicate in three ways, which is um, feeling, thought, and uh, another thing that I think was kinetic. And I think it would be interesting to see if nowadays the majority of the people are, are more in feeling and more the, the word or kinetic in order to approach archaeology in a different way the same way as before science and art mm. and the uh, unknown, the unseen was all mm. put together. Mm. We have separated now to make the majority uh, into math and the object. And this, I think, is very interesting to get to the new step to focalize that maybe the new period in the human being would be more feeling. Mm. Mm. Whereas I was really surprised when I saw the going now to just go into our inner self. And when I saw the museum, this museum, I've always been coming to see it. And I was very surprised with the design and still design the changes in this museum. And I thought, okay, it has been a big change, mm -hmm. but it was focused, the architect, on drama and theater. And they isolated the sensor touch towards pushing the button on the video, the same as they isolate the kids at home to work with video games. Okay. And all based on darkness. So the visual, that non-visual trend that you mentioned okay. has been minimized and also the senses. Okay. With excuse of that nowadays we have to wait for the new generation to be able to see it so that our present moment, the mm. erosion of ourselves, will not affect the new generation. Mm. And I think it would be very interesting to apply this archaeology mm. to architects mm. for mm. urbanism and museums like this one. I'm, I like the changes, but I feel there's a lack of, it isolated it into darkness and the senses, mm. and they pushed us all like sheep, right? Mm. To touch that button to that video game, and you you forget the object, and you just see the the, the screen. And this can be applied um, as an example of study is the mobile, the evolution of the mobile, the screen. We first uh, touch the keys, and now we touch the screen, mm. and we think we're getting closer to communication, okay. but it's flatter. I think those yeah. kind of uh, it was more of a comment than a question, so I don't have much to to say here. Uh, one, only one or two points in relation to psychology. Your starting point, I am aware of some of this literature that you you mentioned, but I, I preferred and I have used in my book not psychology, but anthropology and ethnographic examples, uh, for many reasons. First of all, because I think ethnographers study communities. Very often, psychologists study individuals. But also anthropology deals with you know, contemporary interesting examples that we can actually use in archaeology. As for the museum, there are the colleagues here and they can actually talk if they want to this issue. I have seen many national museums around Europe and I think this one is, is, is very innovative in many different ways. But there are also some uh, dominant museographic conventions the world over that museums often follow. Um, as for architects, they already have uh, a lot of interesting thinking about the senses developed because they are 
applied you know, people and they want to create spaces where multisensorial experience needs to be invoked and, and activated all the time. So they actually have some interesting thinking to, to teach us and tell us.